Hello, everyone, and welcome to Positive Forward Motion. This is your host, Denise Scattergood. Get ready to be inspired on this very special guest episode. Listen in as I have the pleasure of interviewing Valerie Condos Field, also known as Miss Val. Valerie has coached the UCLA Bruins gymnastic team to seven NCAA national championships. She's one of only two coaches to have ever been inducted into UCLA's Athletic Hall of Fame and is the Pac-12 Coach of the Century. Today, Valerie is sharing her insights on joy, success, and how each decision we make choreographs our lives. I'm so excited to be here with you today, and there's nothing better than being here at UCLA headquarters and walking around with you, and so thank you so much for this honor. And for everyone out there, this is Valerie Condos Fields and Miss Val, right? I can yes. go by Miss Val's okay. So seven NCAA championship winning seasons, UCLA Athletic Hall of Fame, Pac-12 Coach of the Century. Mm-hmm. Yes? Yes. Okay. Um, and... What I love so much when I I had the opportunity to hear you speak and you walked into a room and holy smokes, I mean, you were the last speaker and you should have been bookends beginning and end because you just made it happen. But I read your book, you know, life is short. Don't wait to dance. Thank you. And I've read it and I've read it. It's phenomenal. And your philosophy, it's not about winning and losing. Right. Right. You share with me. It's about doing what with your life. It's about, uh, A, each of us defining our own success every day and working on that in a positive forward motion. Oh, get the plug in. Thank you. It is all about PFM. Absolutely. Um, And at the end of the day, being able to just have a little moment, quiet, one-on-one time, and debriefing your day and being able to say, you know what, I, I did a good job today. And if we can chalk up more days than that in the course of a lifetime, we've lived a good life. I love it. Absolutely. And I need you to please share with the audience um, how you got started. Because one of the topics on my positive forward motion is ask, right? And I always talk about it. It's the ask muscle. We need to build our ask muscle. And <laughs> ask, there's ask, a K on the end of that word. We have to build our ask <laughs> muscle. Okay. Yes, but you've helped build a lot of those muscles with your team, so we'll have fun there. But um, just share a little bit because you really, if you didn't ask, I mean, share your story mm-hmm. from how mm-hmm. you. Well, you st- are open this podcast with all of the accolades, which are very fun. Uh, all of the wins and the Hall of Fame and. Um, all of those but I believe the most fun fact is that I've never done gymnastics and so I've coached here at UCLA for 37 years and earned all of those accolades but I've never gone upside down I never did gymnastics I never played organized sport and I was a ballet dancer but my dream was to go to UCLA and I was 22 years old I'd not gone to college and I really missed academia and I was getting ready to start my first season with the Washington DC Ballet and I heard via the universe somehow that UCLA needed a dance coach for their gymnastics team and I heard UCLA and I heard dance and I thought "Ah, I can do that and without any hesitation I found out who the head coach was his number and called told him my credentials I'd studied classical ballet for 17 years had choreographed a bit and I made the ask. And I just said, you know, I, I understand you need a dance coach and a choreographer. Um, I'd love to come out and meet you and share what I can what I can offer. And I'll never forget when he said, we don't have a salary for you, but I can offer you a full scholarship if you haven't gone to school. And I had not gone to school. And it was like, oh my gosh, my wildest dream just came to fruition. And when now 37 years later and I look at this unbelievably wonderful career that I've had it all started because I wasn't afraid to make the ask absolutely and how many of us I mean what is the worst thing that can happen if you ask the answer could be no it's a no before you ask right right and why would you take it personally like if he had said no thank you why would I take that personally he doesn't even know me 
so it was it was no big deal um and and as important as the ask is if you really are feeling it in your heart it's important to learn how to nudge without being annoying i have been nudged many times by people who have wanted an interview with me or want to go to coffee with me to talk about leadership or coaching and I, you know, my, my, my brain goes, I'm sorry, I don't have time. I just don't have time. Sorry, I don't have time. And the ones that effectively, respectfully nudge, I can say almost 100% of the time, I will be sitting down with them. They'll get the meeting. Effectively, respectfully nudge. Well, <laughs> and, and that ties into, in your book, you talk about the broken record. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. I, I remember growing up, uh, my mother had read the book um, When I Say No, I Feel Guilty. And it was one of the first psychology books that really took everybody by storm. And I was sitting in our kitchen, I think I was 15, 16 years old with some of our, um, some of my girlfriends. And there was a guy that had asked one of my girlfriends out and she didn't want to go out with him. And my mother had just read this chapter on the broken record. And the broken record talks about being true to what you want, being true to your voice, compiling a short sentence of what your desires are, and then saying that over and over and over and over again. And the example that I give in the book is actually when I was in college, um, (laughs) I was, someone asked me out to dinner and I said yes, and after dinner, you know, I shook his hand, said, thank you very much. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And he said, well, I live right around the corner. You want to come over for a drink? And I said, no, thank you. And he said, why not? And at that moment, I remembered my mom's lesson. And I kicked in the broken record. And my broken record was, thank you so much for the evening. I really enjoyed it. I'm going to go home now. And he said, but I, I just live around the corner. Why don't you just come over for one drink? And I said, thank you very much. I really enjoyed the evening. I'm going to go home now. And he said, what? Do you have an early meeting tomorrow morning? And at that moment, I realized the beauty of the broken record is you don't veer from exactly what you've said before. Because if I would have said, no, I don't have an early meeting, or yes, I do, you're opening the door for conversation. There is no conversation. You asked me to dinner. I said, yes. I enjoyed myself. I hope you did as well. And now I'm going home. You didn't ask me to come over for a drink or whatever else he thought was going to happen. And this went back and forth for a few times. Then he finally said, you mean I bought you dinner and this is all I get? Oh, snap. So he (laughs) fell into his own trap. And I love that because when he said why, you didn't answer the why. And how often, right, do we fall into that, getting into that dialogue, then it starts getting uncomfortable and it goes round and round and round. And you were very clear, concise. To the point, respectful, thankful. Absolutely. But no thank you. And then his true colors came out at the very end. Well, and you know what? Why do we, I, I think so often in times we feel that we need to explain ourselves. Why do we need to explain ourselves? I, I, I ask that to our student athletes all the time. So I coach 18 to 22 year old girls and I've been here over three decades. The issues are the same issues are the same issues, right? And I'm, I have had this conversation with them a lot, is that as long as you're respectful and you explain yourself concisely, you don't have to explain yourself to anyone. When they say, well, why don't you want to go out with me again? You don't have to explain that they were boring or you didn't have any chemistry. You just need to say, thank you so much for the invitation. Mm-hmm. I am not inclined to accept it. Thank you. Yeah. Simple. Not interested. It's very simple. Very simple, right? Our words, are, well, our words can get us in trouble. They can. And yes, we have to be very mindful of that. And that ties right into your athletes. When I'm listening to your book, and, I, and as I share it, I'd be sitting on a plane when I'm listening to it on my um, on Audible, pumping my fist, <laughs> just so excited because so much of it, it's not about the athlete it's about the person and making them so well rounded and having them just be better humans for society and for themselves the Absolutely. things that you taught them and one of the things that i loved was helping athletes find their joy 
because I can't imagine I've never done that kind of training, but when you hear the stories of the 15-year-old gal who at 15 has been training her whole life and she stopped finding joy in her sport, I can't imagine what that feels like. And I also feel for that young girl so much of her self-worth, perhaps, in her life growing up was how well she did at sports. So then what happens, you're 15, and you're not enjoying it anymore. You're not just stopping the sport. It can take so much from you. And I remember when I was reading about Caitlin Ohashi, Ohashi, Ohashi. Um, share a little bit about her story and how you helped her find her joy. I felt that was just wonderful. Well, Caitlin was extremely talented, and at 12 years old, she moved from her, she grew up in Seattle, and so she and her mother actually moved uh, to be trained by better, better, I'm doing the quotes, coaches. And uh, she was unbelievably talented, and at that point, one of the best gymnasts in the world. And so we had the, her coach, the United States, had this diamond. And her job was to learn the hardest skills in the world and to figure out how to compete them unwaveringly and how to win. That was her job. That was her why. That's all it was. And it wasn't bigger than that. And um, she won the American Cup when she was 15 years old and which is at that in that year it was the the biggest gymnastics meet in the world she's the last gymnast to have beat Simone Biles and I remember I was recruiting out that summer and a few weeks after she'd won the American Cup and she called me and I'll never forget answering the phone and she says hi Miss Val this is Caitlin Ohashi and I was like oh my gosh it might have well have been Kobe Bryant or Serena Williams or someone on the other end of the line and um, we just started talking, and she said I, she didn't want to train anymore for the Olympics, and she was done with elite gymnastics. And I said, wow, um, why? And she said, because I just don't enjoy it. And I said, when was the last time you loved gymnastics? She was 16 when she called me. She said, when I was 11, before I went elite. And I said, so you've spent a third of your life. And before I could even say it, she finished the sentence and said, miserable. Mm. And so she came to UCLA and put on the ubiquitous freshman 10, 15, whatever it was, um, pretty much rebelled. And, and later on, she told me that every, everything I told her to do, she did the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. And um, it was halfway through her freshman year. She was about maybe 60 or 70 percent of the athlete that I'd recruited. She was on a full scholarship. And we were in a, a team meeting with our sports psychologist, and he was explaining to all of our student athletes in the meeting that every single one of us has an anchor inside of us that is holding us down and holding us back from releasing all of our brilliance and all that we can be. So he was going around one at a time and asking each of us, what is the anchor that we feel is holding us personally back? And when he got to Caitlin, she very simply and clearly and unapologetically said I don't want to be great again mm. and he looked to me and he said coach how does that make you feel and I said I feel like I was just sucker punched and he she went on to explain that when she was great she was miserable so why would she want to go back to that when there was no joy in that mm -hmm. and at that point I realized I couldn't force her to want to be great I couldn't dictate to her to get in shape and to compete well I couldn't dictate for her to be a good team player I could strip her scholarship from her but what was that going to do in helping this young person find their value in this world and I realized that I was going to have to earn her trust and it took <laughs> a lot of patience on my part but um, I realized that here's this whole human being that the only part of her that she had felt was of any value was the athlete that was Caitlin Ohashi, not everything else that was Caitlin Ohashi. So I started fortifying the other parts of Caitlin. And every time we were out of the gym, um, I would ask her to lunch periodically, or even when we were in my office, I made, sure, I made a point of never, ever talking to her about gymnastics. 
and I wish I had like this this camera feed of us going out to lunch over the next few months because she would always show up with this wall and as she as we got through the lunch and we started talking about her relationships her family what she wanted to do in life the things that give her joy the wall you could just see it shed and you could see her affect just relax and it took about a year and a half of consist of me consistently showing her I cared about her more as a human being than as an athlete. And even though the athlete, the athlete part was, was important because it's part of her, mm-hmm. it wasn't all of her. Right. And from that, she started like literally peeling the onion and this joyful young woman that used to be so joyful growing up started blossoming again. and. It's not just this last year that her floor routine went viral. It went viral the year before uh, when she was a junior. And everybody thinks her routine this year went viral because she got a 10. That's not the reason. Because her, in her junior year, she went viral, 150 million views, and she got a 995. Wow. So it wasn't the 10. Right. But it was the joy. And everybody around the world that has commented on why they love watching her, it's because she's doing something really hard with a lot of joy and i'm gonna name drop right now okay yes i've had this conversation um about joy a few months ago with kobe bryant and we were talking about how important it is to never ever take the joy out of learning anything but there's the difference between fun and joy and fun in athletics is like recess joy is comes from that inner joy comes from setting yourself up for a really hard challenge and then figuring out what the plan is to achieve the challenge and then working the plan diligently Mm -hmm. and when it's your idea when it's your motivation that's doing this there's a sense of pride that is joyful and as Kobe said he says you know look at any professional athlete or any athlete that's in the zone and you see this joy on their face you've never seen an athlete in a, in the quote unquote zone that has been downtrodden or frustrated or upset they're always shining a beacon of light through joy and think about that it, you know you helped her find her whole person and it's a good reminder for us because it's that Difference between inspiration and motivation. Sometimes folks go, ah, I just need to get motivated. Well, when you're inspired to do something and the why behind what you're going to do and then the steps, that gives you the motivation to want to continue even when it gets difficult. Absolutely. And sometimes we forget to step back. And then also for a young girl like her, I mean, I don't know how she grew up, but oftentimes I see, I equate it to childhood stars when people will give them such a hard time because they went down such a bad road. And sometimes I'll say, but you don't know what it was like to be them. You don't know what it might be like to wake up when you're 12 years old and your whole self-worth that day is everyone sharing how well the tabloids wrote about you or how well you did or how you did on this or that. So you think that is your whole self-worth, but you helped her see everything about her. Mm -hmm. You helped her identify and find herself again so she could find that inspiration and that joy and that motivation. And you're right, when when other people are watching and the video went viral, Mm -hmm. not because it's perfect, Mm -mm. the energy came right through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're touching on a subject that I'm feeling very passionate about these days and I speak a lot about this. Um, And that is we have an obligation as parents and as coaches to redefine winning and success for our children. And there is a reason why uh, in this day and age there are more reports of loneliness and anxiety and stress and sadly suicide. And it's because of the expectations that we as adults are putting on our children. And, um, you know, we went through a horrific thing with gymnastics in this country the last few years and I've been asked quite often how do we change the culture of gymnastics and I very quick to respond it's not about gymnastics it's how do we change our culture of how we're raising our children Um, we've got to redefine success for ourselves 
and for them because so much of parenting and coaching comes from the ego mm -hmm. you know how many how often how many parents do you know that love to pat their kids on the back in public and say oh little johnny he got an a in physics today it's like is that really about little johnny or is it about you right. as the parent we're seeing that with this with the admission scandal in colleges is it about the child that wanted to go to that college or is that the parents bragging rights to get the college the, the athlete the their child into college right and I just feel like um, when you put winning above people when you put the almighty dollar because winning is all about the almighty dollar the root of all evil mm -hmm. right above people that's when you open your organization to corrosiveness that spreads like cancer sure and does. it's it's on us all of this this reporting of loneliness anxiety stress suicide that's on us adults that's not on kids putting that on themselves that's on us mm -hmm. and we need to take responsibility for it and we need to start changing it and that doesn't mean that everything is recess okay it means that if I have a, a daughter who's not built to be a gymnast but she loves gymnastics I'm not gonna tell her she can't do it because she's never gonna win. I'm gonna say, okay, you're gonna do this, you're gonna do it to the best of your ability every single day. Here we go. I re and you know what, I, I, re I learned this, I didn't learn it, but it came back to me when somebody asked me where did I learn it. My brother is a rocket scientist. He's all left He's brain. The, okay. He is a rocket scientist, right. literally. He's the one I go, oh, take a rocket scientist. Now I, I kind of know one. Yes, you <laughs> yes. know someone who's the sister yes. of a rocket scientist. scientist. And I have no left brain. I science and math are they I don't understand it at all. And I worked really, really hard in physics. Really hard and I got a D. I passed the class. And I remember coming home and my mom going, That's so cool. Good job. <laughs> Way to go. Now you don't have to take it again. Awesome. And that was it. That was the extent mm -hmm. of the discussion of me getting a D in physics. It's, it's being authentically you. Mm -hmm. It's what to find our children. Now, I've, I've raised two daughters, and they're completely different. Completely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know family members at times would say, oh, why can't you be more like this or this? And I'd be like, no, 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 no. No. Mm -hmm. They are uniquely, wonderfully, independently who they are. And that's amazing, and it's wonderful, and that's what should be celebrated. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. Not trying to be someone we're not, and, and let's tie in social media and put yeah. something out there that everybody has to like, and, you know, am I this and am I that? Like, there's so much work that needs to be done mm -hmm. to unwind for, the, for even parents, like you said, to help the children. And I used to laugh and say, well, what do you mean you can't get your kid's head out of the computer or the phone? You're the parent. Right. Just take, just take it away. Right. right. You just take it away right. and go do things that requires that right. you're not going to have that. I mean, it, it is. It's, right. it's our job, and we can't let that, that move. And I love talking about working on the strengths and building on, you know, like it sounds like your mom was amazing because she understood that you had this creative side of your brain and – Good for you. So for you to just get a D in a in a class that you weren't going to take another class like that if you didn't have to, that was a celebration. Let's one of find my, things to celebrate. One of my favorite things when I'm speaking and I'm speaking to young people is I always tell them I want you to think about something. Okay, how many people have lived before you've lived? Like how many billions? I don't know how many. I don't know because remember I have no left brain, so I don't do math. <laughs> um, how many people have ever lived before you? And they go, okay, nobody. Okay, and when you die, will there ever be another you? And when they start connecting those dots, and then I say, there has never been another you on this planet, and there never will be. You're here for a reason. And you don't have to go curing cancer to be that reason. Just you being your authentic self being kind and helping someone feel good about themselves today is why you're here because nobody else has what you have to do that you're here for a reason you're not a mistake
-hmm. You're here for a reason. And you see their little eyes start like spinning and glowing. And it's like, it's so cool for them to get, I think it's like the first time that they realize they are unique. They are a gift. Now let's just, as you say, I mean, I love what your podcast stands for. It's taking one step forward in a positive direction every day. And it doesn't matter how big that step is. Right doesn't matter it doesn't how matter. big or how small. And to help <laughs> each other along the way is, is absolutely, because when we're helping others and doing, it's so inspiring. And again, as I'm reading your book and I'm listening, I'm like, you get back so much of what you're giving. And you came into a sport and athletics that was done a different way. I mean, you were the epitome of being authentically you. But I think there was a time where maybe I remember mm -hmm. reading where maybe you thought, well, maybe I should do it this way. Maybe I should follow what mm -hmm. the so-called norm is. And I think you realized very quickly that wasn't very comfortable when you were studying other coaches. Right, right. Well, I was asked to be the head coach after I'd been here seven years. They called me in their office, athletic director, and they asked me to be the head coach. And I laughed in her face and I said, you know, I don't know the first thing about gymnastics. And she said, I've observed how you work with the student athletes. I like how you're compassionate but firm and I trust you'll figure the rest out. And so I thought, I was 30, 29, 30. I didn't know anything about gymnastics. I didn't know anything about this world of sport, athletics. So, but I grew up on stage I knew how to act. I'll just act like a coach. So I studied coaches and I started acting like them. And we did horribly. And I was not, I would chuckle inside when I would say these things with a really stern face and just be mean spirited because that's what I thought a coach was. Right? right? And um, honestly, it wasn't until I happened upon the great Coach Wooden, Coach John Wooden's definition of success. And here his, was this coach. He'd won 10 championships in 12 years. He was touted as the greatest coach of any sport that ever lived. And his definition of success is success is peace of mind, which is a direct result in knowing you've done your best. And I read it over and over and over again because I'm, I'm a gymnastics coach at a major university. I am hired to win. Why didn't his definition discuss winning right. because in our profession that's what we're hired to do mm -hmm. and I read it over and over and I had the biggest aha moment of my life when I realized success is peace of mind and knowing you have done your best and I had been trying to be somebody else that's why it wasn't working out so well so I scrapped trying to be somebody else I went back to the drawing table and I thought about what do I bring as a coach of young women in the sport of gymnastics? What do I bring having had 17 years of classical ballet training? And there was a lot of similarities. There was a lot that I could bring to the table, especially getting them to embrace and fortify their whole selves and, and, and being so well prepared mentally, emotionally, as well as physically that when they stepped on the competition floor, they were excited and not nervous. Right. They were excited and not fearful. They went out there with joy and excitement, not such an expectation of fear and rigidity. I mean, that, is that a word? Rigidity? Yes, oh yes. Yes, so you know, I, I remember reading in how previous coaches and different camps just make it so hard and you have to this and this, this and this. But you know what, at the end of the day, Denise, we, need all, we all need to get over ourselves. Yeah. We really need to get over ourselves. So when I was looking at my why, why was I going to coach? Because think about it. As far as fans go, and as far as, as far as the business side of athletics, it's all about bragging rights. Mm -hmm. When you're able to say, ha-ha, we beat you in the World Cup. Ha-ha, China, we beat you in the Olympics. Ha-ha, we beat you. Starting from Pee Wee football, when you say, ha-ha, we beat you, it translates to money. It translates to ego and money, okay? How, how, what's the word when it's not important? Frivolous. Frivolous is that. 
Mm-hmm. It's just like there had to be more to coaching than haha, we beat you. And so then I realized very quickly when I started analyzing it that the venue of athletics teaches really, really tough life lessons that you don't learn in the classroom. It teaches perseverance. It teaches working through pain. It teaches how to be a part of a team. It teaches all these things that, are, that will fortify you as a human being to be a better version of yourself, caring about other people, not just yourself. And I was like, whoa, this is, I basically, my job is training champions, developing champions in life through sport. And if I do that well enough, that's gonna translate to the competition floor. And as I've thought about this over the years, every once in a while, one of those champions becomes a superhero. Mm -hmm. And they go out in the world and they make a really big difference in a positive way. And that cool part about when you look at that responsibility of developing these young adults into champions in life, it makes you have to walk the walk. And so imagine, yes, you're teaching it and you're living it and developing champions in life through sport. So what you're sharing, it's it's not about the sport. It is about the person in life. And yes, some go out and be superheroes, but even the ones that we don't hear are superheroes are still superheroes because right. everything that, right. you, that you embodied and stayed authentically you and teach these girls to unfold, then they're – Think of who they're going to teach, their children or their children's children or if they're teachers or if they're coaches or when they're grandparents, what they're going, it it continues. Mm-hmm. And you can't, that's what you can't monetize. That's what you can't right. count. That's what you, you, and you're right, get over ourselves. I mean, why are we here? It's that one little right. person at a time. It's right here, right now. Even walking through UCLA with you, right? Everyone, yes, knows who you are, but you are so authentically you, holding doors and saying hello and hi, and you embody what you preach. You practice what you preach, which I always say, how we do anything is how we do everything. And I loved your quote um, when I read it. It was, um, I have it right here. It was great. And it was, you share with me, how do you say it? It was what some, what one does some of the time, one does all of the time. Mm-hmm. And in so much of my training and teaching, I often laugh and say, you're not a couch potato at home. And then you come out into the real world or work and you kick it. Right. You you can fake it for a little bit, but you're going to be uncovered. And acting as if and faking it are two different things. Because mm-hmm. acting as if you already know something, sometimes you're going <clears> to <throat> embody that, as you mentioned. And you're going to act as if until you are that. Mm-hmm. Right? But the understanding that every day everybody's going through some type of struggle right we all are we all are we and we need to get over ourselves yes <laughs> and uh we need to like you know i i am spiritual i think about what the heck are we all doing here in the first place and i none of us have the answer none of us do um but there is a component of humanity and there's a component of Whomever is going to come into my life, into my realm today, or whosever life I'm going to come into theirs today, I have a, a moral obligation that I am excited about to make my experience with that person positive and memorable. And make I want everybody that comes into my path to walk away feeling better about themselves just a little bit than before they came in the path. And if... Imagine like if we could do that with everyone we come in contact with, the grocery store clerk, the person in the aisle that dropped potato chips all over the place, whomever it is. Would I, that be you <clears throat> dropping those potato Yeah, chips? I know. I had to bring up chips. <laughs> I bring up chips all the time because I'm a chipaholic. Yes. But going back to the joy, even thinking back to me studying for physics, you know, I just absolutely know, and I – When I become a research scientist, (laughs) I'm 60, so when I become a research scientist, I'm going to study this and quantify it. But I know when joy is infused in the process of learning anything, you have a better outcome. You have a better um, retention, experience, product, product, 
then then only if you're doing it because you're being compliant and that's how so many co- teachers teach that's how so many coaches coach that's how so many parents parent because i said so mm-hmm. and getting back to what you said earlier about the difference between inspiration and motivation is in coaching in the profession that i've been in for 37 years there's a lot of coaches that that simply dictate change get your legs straight on your back hands for me because i said so but what i have found is when i can explain why they're going to have a better experience with the skill if they get their legs straight in the skill then that motivates them to want to change so in my opinion coaching is motivating change in anyone Mm -hmm. and the only reason that all of us need a coach is to do the things that we can't do by ourselves and I love what you just said it's motivating change it's helping the other person to see and want to make the change to better themselves and that's where the inspiration comes from absolutely to want to do it differently want to do it differently yes and I know that the listeners are are so inspired by this podcast and I want to thank you so much for your time today and I could as I mentioned your book we could go on uh, each topic we could spend Mm -hmm. hours on because it's so amazing and that's going to be our road trip okay that's we're going to take the dog and pony show let's just take this out on the road okay (laughs) okay so it's it is positive forward motion live show we yes. will do our very first live show. I already know where we're going to do it at the Thousand Oaks Civic Arts Center. Let's do it. And I know exactly how it's going to be on the platform, and it's going to happen in October, <gasps> so we will work out those dates. Can I choreograph the flash mob? Yes, please. Okay. Absolutely. Done and yes, done. Yes, please. we got to get everybody up dancing <laughs> yeah. and ready to go. Absolutely. So if there was one thing, I mean, there's so much, but if there was one thing today that you're feeling to leave the Positive Forward Motion listeners with, one little topic, something to just take with you today, what would that be? That would be that the one thing that I wish every one of my student athletes gets before they graduate from our program, and that is the understanding that every single thing you do is a choice in life. And every choice you make is gonna have numerous repercussions. And so the choices you make dictate the life you lead. And the hard part about that is that Every choice, every action we make starts with our thoughts. And we are in control of those thoughts, even though we want to believe we're not. Mm-hmm. Because if you believe, if you, the minute you accept the fact that you are in control of your thoughts, you give up the right to be a victim. That's right. And most of us don't want to give that up. So I've also experienced that when you take responsibility for your thoughts, your emotions, consequently your actions, it really does open up your world in living color. You live a different life because you are fully responsible. Well, you're no longer just getting up and being pushed around. You're not like in a washing machine or a a whirlpool. You're actually, you're riding the wave. Right. You get to be in the driver's right. seat. And you should because it's your life. Right. It is your life. Right. And um, I brought some books today, so I'm going to have you sign some. Great. So what we'll do is we'll give some away. Thank you. On, and that'll be so much fun. And again, thank you so much. You thank just you. epitomize positive forward motion. And it is my honor to be here with you today. You are a doll. Thank, thank you, you so for much. all you're doing for this. You this is it. fabulous, Denise. You got it. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to hop on over to denisecattergood.com and sign up to be put on our email list. This way you're not going to miss out on any giveaways. And of course, Valerie signed a book for me to give away. And you'll also learn about events and great things that are happening here at Positive Forward Motion. Our first event is right around the corner. So don't forget to hop on over to denisecattergood.com, join our email list, As always, I'm wishing you continued success both personally and professionally and keep up the positive forward motion.